Hello, my name is Chad Chang, and welcome to another Podmedics podcast. Today we're going to talk about the basics of burns. So here are our learning objectives. The recognition and management of burns injury is part of the undergraduate medical curriculum. The aim of this lecture is to provide a short summary of the most pertinent points of burns recognition and management, of which you may be tested in your undergraduate examination. For example, in a viva or an OSCE, you may be asked to perform an emergency ABC station for someone who has had a burn, in combination with a burn size estimation, or alternatively, you may be asked to calculate the flurry requirements of the said patient. On a written paper, you may be asked to determine the rate or volume of flu resuscitation in someone with a known burn size and weight, or you may be asked to identify size estimation techniques. Given that we are focusing on the basics, we will not be covering inhalational burns, chemical burns or electrical burns. For those of whom that are short of time or seeking a more high yield approach of learning, I would suggest that the highlighted section are the very essential parts that you should be learning about. So a little bit of background information. Burns is a very common problem. It is estimated around half percent of the UK population gets burns every year. This can range from very minor burns that recovers without any medical input to severe burns that require prolonged intensive care input and leading to long-term morbidity. Most of these happens at home, the, with the kitchen and bathroom being the frequent offenders. Burns can affect a wide range of age group, from children to the elderly. And according to different age groups, the underlying causes of the burn may differ. In the pediatric group, scalds is the most common causes of burn, which can occur with bath water, spillage from inhalational therapy, and most commonly due to spillage from putting the recently made cup of tea or coffee from the kitchen counter onto self. So what is a burn? Not the most difficult question in the world. And actually, the answer is quite obvious. But given the fact that this is a Burns lecture, we ought to talk about it. I like to define it as a traumatic or thermal injury sustained by various means. And frequently, I find it highly emotionally charged and stressful for the patient, for their families, as well as the staff working around the patient. It can be very difficult for someone who has never seen Burns before to see a severely burned patient for the first time. Comfort in dealing with burns patient only really comes with knowledge and experience and hopefully this lecture will give you a nice starting point in dealing with burns patients. You can't really talk about burns without talking about Jackson's model. This is described in 1953 by clinical observation as well as studying the histology of burns. In a study, it is found that there are three zones to a burn. The central area is the zone of coagulation, otherwise known as zone of coagulative necrosis. This is where the tissue is closest to the heat source. In this area, there is rapid cell death. Surrounding this area is the zone of stasis. This is an area of tissue where immediate cell death has not yet occurred, secondary to the burn. The circulation is compromised due to microcirculation damage. If this is not treated, the inflammatory reaction will progress and this zone will go under necrosis. Clinically, this is seen as progression of the burn depth, where initially the tissue may appear viable but later become necrotic after a few days. On the outermost area is the zone of hyperemia. This is where there is zone of vasodilatation secondary to inflammatory mediators. Once this hyperdynamic vascular state resolves, the tissue becomes normal afterwards. On this slide you can see a graphical representation of the Burns model. It is important to see that this is a 3D structure where the zone of stasis is around as well as deep to the zone of coagulation. Similarly, the zone of hyperemia is around and deep to the zone of stasis. The objective of resuscitation and first aid is actually to preserve the zone of stasis, as we mentioned from the last slide, i.e. to prevent it from becoming the zone of coagulation. 
Before we progress to the next slide, I want you to pause the video. Have a think for a minute here. Imagine you are the A&E doctor, and you've just been told that there is someone coming in with a burn. What would you do for a first aid? What would you do as a first step? Airway, breathing, circulation. If you are recently graduated or studying at this moment, you probably would have already had this drummed into you. Burns is no exception. The fact that burns can occur in a range of circumstances, such as road traffic accidents, explosions, electrocution, jumping or falling whilst escaping from a burn, means that burns may come alongside with a lot of other injuries. There is very little point in having a perfectly managed burn when your patient is dead. When it comes to first aid, I like to think that there are two primary objectives: stopping the burning process and cooling the burn wound. Stopping the burn is fairly straightforward to achieve in most circumstances by removing the patient from the heat source, or vice versa. Cooling the burn wound would require the use of cold water. Preferably 15 degrees, but between 8 and 25 degrees is okay. Reason that cooling is used as is because that it reduces the inflammatory reaction. This can stop the progression of necrosis in the zone of stasis. Water irrigation is effective for the first three hours of a burn. Usually, we say for 20 minutes. However, you can continue continue to irrigate. If the patient finds this reduces the pain, it is important to note that, however, patients with burns, particularly children, are prone to hypothermia. Therefore, a decision to continue irrigation should be balanced with the risk of hypothermia. In chemical burns, it is very important to know what chemical it is prior to water irrigation, as the chemical itself may react with the water, and this may potentially cause further burns. Ice water or ice cubes should be avoided, as this causes vasoconstriction, which deepens the tissue injury. So there are several techniques that one can use when it comes to surface area estimation. Here we aim to provide a brief overview of the three most common use techniques of Palmer rules, rules of nines, as well as the use of London Browder charts. So Palmer rules. It is not the most accurate、uh, method of estimation, but it is very useful as a quick estimation, where a London Browder chart is not available, or the burns pattern is not easily estimated using the rules of nine. You have to use the patient's hand, not your own hand, as you can very easily over or underestimate the burn. When it comes to the hand. Um, you have to include the palm and the fingers. That would equal to one percent. As we said before, it's not very accurate. You can overestimate and underestimate depending on the gender and age. Rule of nines, as the name suggests, the body is divided up into groups of nine percent. For the anterior trunk, this is eighteen percent. For the posterior trunk, eighteen percent. And nine percent for each upper limb, and eighteen percent for each lower limb. Nine percent for the head, and one percent for the external genitalia and perineum. This is useful for age ten upwards. You can't use it for children under the age of ten, because this would lead to inaccurate estimation due to the difference in head to body ratio. For children under the age of ten. You can technically use adaptations of the rules of nines. However, this is slightly more complex and not in the scope of this lecture. London Browder chart, in my opinion, is something that we should be using all the time if we're able to when it comes to estimating surface areas of burns. What it does is it divides the body into different areas with different percentages, which adds up to the total of one hundred percent. And in different age groups, there are different London Browder charts to accommodate for the changing head-to-body ratio and limb-to-trunk ratio. Another advantage with the London Browder chart is that when assessing using the chart, you draw the patterns 
of the burn onto the graph itself with um, various shades which indicates either full thickness or partial thickness. This is a very useful um, way of recording a burned pattern as well as burned depth. This will allow to com good communication with your colleagues when handing over or sharing information. On this slide is a diagram showing both the rule of nines and London Browder chart. Rule of nines on the left and London Browder chart on the right. These charts are very much readily available online and most trusts have their own versions of um, London Browder charts. Okay, so after all that, hopefully we've got the size estimation down. So let's talk about the depth estimation. So when it comes to estimating the depth of the burn, be aware that this is determined by several factors. First thing is the cause of the burn. As a general rule of thumb, concrete burns tends to be full thickness. And a contact burn from a radiator for someone who's postictal, passed out, or collapsed next to a radiator tends to be the full thickness as well. By comparison, skulls may not necessarily be full thickness. However, this leads to the second point, duration of exposure. Understandably, the longer something is burning, the more likely that it is burning deeper. And the third point, temperature of the source. The higher the temperature, the more underlying tissue damage this may happen, and the deeper the burn would be. It's not exactly rocket science. And one thing to note is that in the UK we no longer use first, second, third and fourth degree when it comes to communicating or estimating burns depth. Apologies for the rather busy looking slide. This is the system we use in the UK to communicate burns depth. Epidermal, superficial dermal, mid dermal, deep dermal and full thickness. As with everything in medicine, it's about the overall picture rather than one particular criteria. We use blistering, colours, capillary refill, sensation and to determine the depth. Take epidermal for example. These kind of burns will be sensate, it will be painful, it will be red, non-blistering with capillary refill. If you imagine your normal sunburn and you get the right picture. It is important to note that these kind of superficial burns are not included in your surface area calculations. The burns that you do include in your surface area calculation is partial thickness which includes superficial dermal all the way to deep dermal and full thickness. It can be a rather daunting task to estimate the depth of the burn. However, this does come with practice and it does come with experience. For the same depth burn, in different age group and different ethnic groups, this may actually look very different. And this is where blistering, capillary refill and sensation comes in very handy. So we've got the surface area and we've got the depth down. Let's talk about fluids. So why do we fluid resuscitate? Well, essentially, burn shock is a major cause of mortality. The acute inflammatory response to a burn causes vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. This leads to leaking of large molecules into the interstitial spaces from the intravascular spaces. This in turn increases the oncotic pressure of the interstitial spaces, causing fluid to move out of the blood vessels, reducing circulating volume and worsening tissue edema. The reduced circulating volume therefore causes end organ hypoperfusion and multi organ failure and death. Therefore, fluid resuscitation aims to replace fluid and electrolyte losses from the intravascular space. Ideally, using the minimum necessary to maintain adequate organ perfusion without causing worsening edema. The indication for fluid resuscitation is 15% burns in adults and 10% burns in children. So the first 24 hours after a burn, the fluid requirement will be calculated using Parkland formula. This is 3 to 4 mils multiplied by total body surface area of the burn, percentages multiplied by weight in kilograms. Once you get the value, this is for the first 24 hours, 
half of which should be given in the first eight hours, whilst the remaining 50% should be given in the next 16 hours. It is important to note that you should be calculating the first 24 hours from the time of burn rather than the time of presentation. The fluid of choice would be heart mint. In children, you would also need to calculate and add in additional maintenance fluid according to weight. The fluid of choice in this circumstance will be dextrin saline. Of course, this is not a one-size-fits-all policy. You will need to titrate fluids according to urinary output and fluid balance. Common targets for adults is half a mil per kilo per hour. For children, one mil per kilo per hour. And for infants, two mils per kilo per hour. So on this slide, there are two scenarios of patients requiring fluid resuscitation. I have calculated the first one and demonstrated my work. Now I'd like you to pause right here and answer in the questions set out for the second example. If you got it right, well done. If you haven't, don't worry and have a relook, and hopefully you'll get it right the next time in the exam. So what kind of burns can be managed locally, and what kind of burns needs to go to a burns unit or burn centre? So here are some general guidelines in terms of referral criteria. However, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you have any particular concerns or worries, it is always worthwhile to discuss with your local burn centre or burns unit. In conclusion, over this session, we have covered some things which are considered to be the basics of burns. It is the more straightforward aspects of the undergraduate curriculum. In this podcast, I hope that we have given you a solid knowledge base of which you can build further knowledge upon in the future. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to check other videos available on the site.